What's up, Des Moines? So today's guest is a guy that I met through the Justice League of Food. He sits on the board for the JLF. He's uh, he's an interesting cat, and I thought that um, it would be great to have him in here and to kind of tell him about the story, what he does, and, and how he can help um, whether you're homeless or whether you're in business. It's two totally different spectrums. So today I am introducing Mark Phillips on Inventation by Invictus. What's up, Mark? Good morning, and how are you doing today? You know, it's, it's another day here at the studio. We've got construction going on outside, <laughs> but it's a beautiful day. It's just another obstacle in, uh, in, the, in the world of podcasting that we, we try to overcome. Yeah, it's uh, fantastic. You know, when I was trying to get in, I was like, are you putting up barriers to entry just to get to the podcast? So I didn't know if uh, I needed to bring my running shoes um, just to be able to get in the front door. American Ninja Warrior style, but it's with cameras and microphones. Very true. Very true. Yeah. Um, So I I met Mark not too long ago. Um, He actually sits on the board for the Justice League of Food, which is one of our nonprofit partners that we do all of their video work for. It's the nonprofit, if you don't know what the JLF is, that's located inside of the Hall DSM over in the Valley Junction area. The JLF pretty much is a free culinary program for at-risk teens or kids that are homeless or have been in the foster care system or just really just had a shitty hand dealt with to them in life. So the program is a two-year program that helps them with getting culinary skills, lifestyle skills. Um, just It helps them teach how to be functioning adults in the real world primarily that's like the basis of it but there's just so much more in depth into it like i don't think we really have homeless kids in the program uh, like i know that they all have places and and things like that and i know we've had mackenzie was a foster kid that you know kind of came out of the foster care system but you know i don't really think that we've actually physically had homeless kids come off the street into the program so you know i think the, from a student perspective, you know, whether they're under 18 or over 18, a young adult, um, they, they're they maybe in transition, right? Maybe right. they've been homeless at one point. Um, to your point, maybe they've some some had some, uh, what I would say, adversity in their process. Uh, but for, for today, most of them do have housing. Uh, they are on their own. Um, however, we are wanting to partner with any agency in town um, that does help uh, youth aged, uh, homeless, um, individuals get back on their feet. And in reality, it's, some of it isn't just about that job. It's more about actually creating job history. Uh, right. So they can actually leave with a certificate and show whether or not they want to be in the culinary world for the rest of their lives, that they have something that they can show history performance. They showed up, they completed a job, Um, So they can move on and and do whatever their next job they would like to do. Right. And you guys actually physically help them as far as placement once they're done with the program. Absolutely. That placement, again, can be can be in a culinary, you know, whether it be a restaurant or, uh, you know, a a line chef or it can be placement towards they want to go to college or they want to have another career um, and help them in that process. You you know, really, the 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 bottom line is, is how can we help them move to the next step so that they aren't homeless and without a job place to live. Right. Yeah. So let's just, we kind of jumped ahead a little. Let's just kind of talk about how you got into it. Like what, what led you to this? Like kind of tell us about like, you know, I mean, if people, people don't know you kind of give me like that cliff note version of who you are, where you came from and what led you to, to where we are today. Yeah, so I'm a <clears throat> I'm an Iowa kid. I grew up an hour north of Des Moines in a small town. Um, I grew up on a farm. Uh, my parents still live there and farm. And and as a junior high kid, my youth group, we came actually down to Des Moines and we uh, we fed a night at uh, Hope uh, Homeless Shelter just down the street from actually where we are, not very far. And it was something that kind of stuck with me. Fast forward to when I was in living in Denver, Colorado. Same thing, helping out at the the mission there in town. Um, and and again, a night serving was super impactful. And from there, it really kind of unearthed my engagement towards uh, 
uh, low income and or homeless individuals of helping them being different the next day? How can we move them Mm -hmm. to a place of sustainability? Um, I think the biggest thing is they have a story. They have a mom or a dad. And as I had kids and looking at my kids and thinking that what would happen if they were homeless, what would I do? And thinking about clients that we've served, um, you quickly realize that they have a story. They have a life. They have something that put them in this place. Right. Some it was self-imposed. Some it was a series of, of horrible steps. Yeah. Um, or mental health issues. Absolutely. And yeah. so I, I think there is something that the greater good or the greater public can do to help. And I think it's super important that people have a place to live. Um, it is right. a well-known fact with stats that say if someone is housed, the level of success that they will have gr- is greater, is, is much higher for them to succeed by having, not necessarily, it's not about ownership. It's just if they have a place that they can call home, they can lock the door, that person will be uh, much more successful in making the next steps. Yeah. Um, so... Fast forward, did a little help in Denver, moved to Des Moines, uh, actually spent a time uh, with the Polk County uh, Continuum of Care, leading that and developing it, uh, basically to try to create a homeless uh, strategic plan for Polk County. Right. Um, Because you left the banking industry. Yeah. You left the banking world, went to work for this initiative, this cause, this nonprofit, Mm -hmm. and then you got back into banking. Right. And so it was kind of... um, People really questioned what the heck am I doing? Um, it was uh, a period of time where you know my life and where I worked uh, a financial institution here in Des Moines was great, good to me. I had a lot of great friends, and and it was that opportunity of like I'm not going to be able to do this again, uh, or it may not. And if it is in front of me, why not take it? And so I right. you know took that jump off the the cliff and had an amazing time. Because um, you were there what three years? Yep, just about three years. Yeah. And it was hard. Man, it was hard. Uh, I think it was something uh, just like everything. It went from me being a volunteer to now working in the industry. Mm-hmm. And I had a ton to learn. You know, my background isn't case management and, and human services. Uh, in fact, my college degree is a communication degree. And so, you know, I had a ton to learn. So it was like jumping into a fire, man. And so, it, you know, every acronym, uh, what really happens in homelessness, how things are connected, realizing there's six subsets of homelessness. Oh, wow. Um, just things like that that I had no context. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was, um, it was really hard, but really amazing. Uh, yeah. So you went from banking world to the homelessness world and then back into banking. But yet you've kept a, your hand as far as like being that that person that volunteers back into the homeless community by doing couple different things I'm doing. So you already mentioned on the Justice League of Food Board. I think, you know, before I jump into the things that I am connected with, I I, I would say there was a period of time, probably probably just 12 months after I left that position that I think I just need to take a step back, refresh. Um, I had spent so much time intently in the industry um, and connected with people that I that I just needed to be able to hit the refresh button. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't about leaving um, and and uh, not caring for homeless clients and or our agencies in town. Right. It was where can I see myself best help people um, and agencies in town. And so uh, jumped in on the Justice League of Food Board uh, again. You know, kind of taking baby steps with every every agency that I'm helping out with. Uh, I'm also helping with the Institute for Community Alliances, uh, which is the data. Uh, of side of homelessness. They help uh, communities assess, review, collect the data. And so for me, that's super important. Just um, it's fascinating to see either numbers change up and down. It's fascinating to see how how if you fund something here, how that affects results here. Or if you don't fund something, um, how does it affect uh, success rates as well. Uh, so helping out with that, also helping out with the Family Promise of Greater Des Moines, which is oh, okay. a family shelter yeah, yeah, uh, here in sure. town. Um, and, and that's kind of what my energy has been towards, uh, but still helping the person that took my, my successor in her role to making it successful. Um, and, you know, and sometimes just because you're not on a board doesn't mean you can't help. And so a lot of it is just some of it. Yeah. And there's is, that big misconception about that. Some of it is just relationships and continuing those. Correct. Right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I think people need to understand that just because you're not on a board or on a committee, you can't help. Uh, and that's where I see myself. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's always good to have outside people that still want to help that actually come from the inside. They just take that that slight step back and then they're still able to be a part of the organization. Yep. Yeah, those are the best people mm-hmm. because they always have, they have really good insight that you just don't think that, you know, you just don't think ahead of that, I guess. Yep. It, it's, you know, when you think about that, um, folks that have been in human services or directly in the homeless world, a lot of people don't go in and out of homelessness, meaning the industry, right? And the, and the same thing with banking. And so when I've crossed and went back and forth, it, what's been super helpful for me is just maybe looking at it from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, there are still rules in both industry. You know, banking's highly regulated. Um, and and so so are homeless programs that are funded by the federal government. And so it's it's looking at how can you effectively run those and still make progress. And so I think that's what's been fun for me over the last, what I would say truly decade, maybe even 15 years of seeing that how can industries change and be innovative so that we can get the best results, not how can we squeeze the dollar, but how can we right. change it so the human right. is better served? Yeah. So- Mental health programs, mental health counseling, mental health doctors, things like that, um, giving them the tools that they need to be successful mm-hmm. by either teaching them a skill or a trade, um, and as well as helping them secure, you know, housing and things like that. Yeah. 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 Job training education is a big one. Mm-hmm. You know, I think what happens is, is sometimes folks find themselves in a position of being homeless because they didn't. They, they stopped education at a certain age mm-hmm. um, and they didn't continue on. And so it, it plateaued. They didn't, they didn't know or didn't have access to get back into and, and in a position to educate. Right. Uh, and so that just stopped them from furthering down the road of whether it be their profession or finding another job. Right. Yeah. I think so maybe six months ago, I read an article about a guy. He was an older gentleman probably in his 50s, maybe late 50s, uh, went to Harvard or, or Yale. It was one of those Ivy League schools up north. Um, was brilliant. Was I think he graduated with a law degree and just basically just went through life and had an undercover drug problem. Mm-hmm. And then he just walked away from all of it and started living on the streets, and the streets of LA, which is probably the worst that you can ever get, right? Like Skid Row is is not a safe place at all. Correct. And uh, I, I think he happened to be on the news and one of his um, former schoolmates happened to see him. And next thing you know, they just all rallied around him and they're just like, you know, I can't remember what his name is. Let's just call him Bob. They're just like, Bob, you know, we need to give you help. And then they found this undercover drug issue that was stem from trauma as a child. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, and, and it, he eventually started doing heroin to, to mass, to cope, right? So they started figuring all these things out and they helped him as far as like the transitional housing mm-hmm. and then just basically get, getting him a job, just doing basic stuff, right? Yeah. Even though he had this law degree, just brilliant man. But it was like all these things that the community wow. did to rally behind this person mm-hmm. because one person went out of their way to help him. So it, that is a great example. So homeless people always wonder why, you know, how do people become homeless, right? And and you, I think people from the outside of the homeless industry or that aren't passionate about it, oftentimes think that you're making up a story. Like maybe the people that are listening to this, maybe all one of them, who knows? Maybe there'll be more than one person that listens to this. Yeah, we you, hope. <laughs> as a listener, you might think, you know, you really made up that story. Um, and what I'll tell you is this, and, and, and I guess as a listener, I want you to like set whatever you have down and just think and listen to these words. You know, there's a nonprofit, uh, in the East coast in North Carolina that, that really started doing more of a observation of actually why people become homeless is lack of relationship. It's not because of housing. Yeah. And I, again, listened to a Ted talk on, on the process and here's what happened. They said, how many people in this room have an empty bed in their house? I can raise my hand right now. Maybe as a listener, you can raise your house, like an empty bedroom in your house that no one uses, okay? Okay. From there, they said, what happens if your mom, dad, sister, brother, or a relative was like, hey, I'm homeless, I need a place to live, would you let them stay there? 
Most people in the room raise their hand. Right. What happens if it was Bob that you mentioned that we called or Sally came up to your front door where you live and said, hey, can I, you have a spare bedroom. I know this and I want to spend the room, spend the night there. Would you let them stay there? Most people would say no. Yeah. And you know why? Lack of relationship. Yeah. They don't know Bob or Sally. Yeah. They know your sister, brother, relative, right? Yeah. Now, I understand sister, brother, relative can ruin that relationship where you kick them out, which there that is a very frequent story. But at the end of the TED Talk, his comment is, people are homeless, yes, for a variety of reasons, but really when you boil it down and you look at your example story of Bob, he didn't have any relationships. He didn't have anybody around him that was right. saying, wait a minute, what are you doing? And and I will, I will say this, even for myself, in my, my acts of every day, I grew up in a small town. Everybody knew everybody's business. Some people can say that's horrible and they hate it. For me, I think that helps out a ton from more of a, like a pendulum, a swing that I get presented with stuff at different times that maybe you could struggle with, right? Whether it's not working out or it's eating too much food and that can snowball and it can pick up quickly. And society is okay with maybe people being overweight. Um, it's not looked down upon as homelessness. Correct. And so there's this huge thing that I think happens when you don't aren't in relationship with people is that you get you start to be really secluded and and things that are non-regular become regular in your life because it's just you. Yeah. And so I would tell you a, a very main reason that people become homeless is lack of relationships. Yeah, I believe that. Because whether you're in a personal relationship, business or romantic or anything in those aspects you have to work hard at it every day right? and people check up on you yeah like it's hard to you know now that i'm back in banking like it's hard to just have a business relationship with some customers some customers you become friends with and your coworkers you become friends with and if something was happening that was not the usual you one of them might say hey what's going on right um, they may not, but but a lot of times it does happen. Correct. And people then surround you and say, how can we help change? Yeah, they rally and then they do whatever that they can to help you come out of it or push through it or or to get you to that next step. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, there's no difference between that and then just, I don't know, going down to the homeless shelter and volunteering. Right. Yeah, you just have to take that chance. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I always like to say, sometimes you have to do uncomfortable things to be a better person. And that's probably one of the most uncomfortable things I think people have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, potentially, you know, a whole bunch of things that you said they're uncomfortable. Going to the homeless shelter and helping that is one. Uh, you don't know if you're safe. You don't know if right. it's going to be horrible. You don't know what questions you're going to be asked. Um, and it, it it can be. Like, it, like even me, still going into the shelter, you still need me to be aware of what's going on, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think at work, if you're trying to confront an employee or a coworker, that's a super sensitive thing. And that's not like just what people do every day. Yeah. Well, unless you're me and you embrace confrontation. So I mean, <laughs> it's I, very true. Yeah. I think, uh, I'm an Enneagram eight in the, in the Enneagram eight, it actually says that you, you take on confrontation. So <laughs> FYI. And I will say it's, when you do have employees that you build that rapport with and you can do that, right? Um, I, I think it makes your day a lot more free. Um, and you don't have to live this world of like closed and quiet um, because you're in open conversation with people. Right. Um, as soon as it turns into dark, it's going to go down the wrong path. Right. Um, and so it, it is helpful and healthy when you have that relationship. So I encourage people to, you know, serve, engage. Um, but it's hard. A lot of times they have to have someone with them. And it, this example is when we were in Denver, my wife and I, you know, we set up, we were the, you know, we went like the first Monday of every month and served. And, and then it was coming up, I, it was either my or her birthday. And, and we wanted to introduce people to homelessness, but we didn't know the right way to pitch it. Correct. And so uh, we actually did a birthday party where we signed up and we said we'd bring 12 people. And we emailed a whole group of people for that my wife wanted to be in the room for her to celebrate her birthday. And we said, hey, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go serve at the shelter. And then after that, we're going to go get dessert. And other people can come after that if they don't serve. And we actually 
oversubscribed our list of 12. And we did that a couple different times. And it was a great way to have people interface with the shelter and then have drinks, dessert afterward to talk about it. And not right. necessarily in a way that's canned. And, and we didn't have to bring a bunch of pamphlets and be like, hey, see, this is why you need to give. Yeah. And it was really awesome. It yeah. was intent. And I think that was the biggest thing. It was the intention. And so I flipped that over when I was uh, working in Boulder, Colorado. I connected with Dave Harms, the CEO at that time of the Boulder Shelter. And I, uh, as a bank, we signed up first Monday of every night or first Monday of every month. Uh, and I took clients and prospective clients and we went and served. Yeah. And then we did dinner and drinks afterwards. And it was fascinating. Um just built, the conversations. Yes. I built some of the best relationships. Um, it was perfect. And so I think what I would encourage everybody to, when they think about serving, whether it's homelessness or kids or um, you name it, right? However you want to serve in your community, uh, at your faith uh, community, I would tell you, um, find someone that you can do it with. It's always a lot better when it's yeah. someone's in relationship. Because huh. you may see something and then not have anybody to talk about it and say, what did I just see? With safety and numbers too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody's doing it with me, then it can't be that bad. Right. And you'll quickly find, oh, this is, I don't want to do this. I don't want to help with homelessness because it's not, I'm not passionate about it. Right. Which is great. My whole thing is, uh, you know, it, we, it's our civic duty to serve and, and connect. And so find something that you can serve and be passionate about, um, do it with your family, do it with your kids, do it with your partner, do it right. with your friends, like do it with your coworkers. Like there's nothing more than spending time and just getting to know people outside of work sometimes. For sure. So do you still do that now? Do you still have the bank go serve now and take prospective clients or clients to the homeless shelters here in Des Moines? So 2009, we had our first kid and four years later we had four. Yeah. So <laughs> Mark has a mini basketball team, if you guys don't know this. They're 10, 9, and 6, and 6, and they're all boys. Yeah. And so life came pretty fast for us, which is all exciting. Yeah. Uh, so my wife and I had to realize some of it is age, right? You know, um, some places don't can't have someone that's that young to serve. Right. And it was also about time. It was, do we want to be away from our family if I'm away all the time during the day working? Um, and so we've had to assess. And so right now we've paused on that. Uh, so we're always trying to find ways that we can do it as a family, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, like at Family Promise, reached out to Jim Kane and said, hey, what can our entire family do? You guys can clean the van once a month. That's something our entire family can do. A six-year-old okay. can help clean the van. Yeah. So what I would tell you is you need to be innovative and engage um, places that you can serve so that it works for your family or your life person. Right? Yeah. Your lifestyle, your time commitments, all mm -hmm. of that. And I want to be sensitive. I don't want to be like, Hey, you need to call, go out and call the nonprofit and create new ways for you to serve. Look and see how you can serve first, see what you can engage with and then yeah. go from there. Yeah. Um, there's plenty. Yeah. It's it, the last thing we need is uh nonprofits get inundated, be like, Hey, can you custom create a way that I can volunteer there? That's, that's well, not what we I'm do. sure somebody's already thinking of that just yeah. so they can create a nonprofit. Right. So, so, uh, but it has been hard. So I've been trying to connect in different ways and mm -hmm. over time we'll be able to jump back into that mix. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When the, when the twins are, are a little bit older and. I think, you know, two six year olds are good at home to help like, you know, maybe cut things and set the table. But I think, uh, to do anything more than that, maybe at a public place, it, it could be a little challenging. Yeah, or disastrous. <laughs> I, I think we'll maybe lead on tor trending towards disastrous, yes. All right, so we have a few more minutes. So to satisfy your boss at Bank Iowa, tell me what Bank Iowa is and what's so special about it. Cliff Note version. Cliff Note version. Bank Iowa is a family-owned uh, since 1976 uh, bank located in Iowa. Our corporate office is in West Des Moines. And we have 26 locations throughout the state. Right. And we have a great mix, meaning 23 of those locations are in towns that are county seats, 10,000 or less in people that are in our rural communities. You know, coming from myself being a, a kid that grew up in a small town, it's awesome to be able to walk into the bank, 
and and have people know your name, right? It's the cheers mentality if people right. are familiar with cheers. Yeah, yeah. Just the bank side. Exactly. Hey, Mark. Yeah, we just don't have yeah. beers uh, on the desk. We It's just maybe, you know, more of a relationship. Uh, like calculators on yeah, the desk. Yeah, calculators <laughs> on the desk, right? No beers, just calculators. And so what we really are trying to do is how can we create what I would say a model that is true community banking between our rural communities and our metro locations uh, to serve our customers. Right. We have a uh, an entire retail platform to serve uh, regular individuals and their banking needs. And we have an entire community uh, 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 corporate side to help businesses, whether it be small startups to uh, corporations of, you know, 250 employees or more. Right. Right. And so what I would say the cliff note, you know, to summarize is it's a place that, that people can be and that we can help people become who they are, both whether it be themselves as an individual um, through their, uh, profession and grow, or it's our customers to see them grow and help them along the way. And that's what I feel like Bank Iowa can it right. is and does. If you want to see Mark's commercials, you can go to the Bank Iowa's YouTube page because the team and I definitely did. And I was like, okay. So there's this one girl, She's right, they're riding bikes, right? And she's talking about how she wants to open up her own bakery. And he's like, I can help with that. So I was like, Mark, if I ever need you, I need you to tell me those words. You know, maybe <laughs> maybe the next podcast we do, we get on that tandem bike because it's actually in our corporate office. Oh, nice. And we just pedal around on the tandem bike and try to do a podcast while oh, biking. Dude, you know, tandem biking, like not stationary is, is very dangerous. <laughs> I know. I think it'd be awesome. Or it could be a tandem biking to different establishments. Oh. And do a podcast live while okay. going from A, we a to B to have, C. We have lots of lavalier mics, so you could be wirelessly mic'd. It'd be perfect. It could be, it, you know, we can hear the heavy breathing and- Panting. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to hear heavy panting on a podcast? I would probably be like, shit, 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 shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're pedaling too fast. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I'd be like, slow down. Oh. I actually, I had a friend not too long ago tell me she went to, um, it was Annie Breeze. Annie <laughs> Breeze. <laughs> she went to Montana last year and took uh, another friend of ours, Megan McCoy, and they did tandem biking. And literally, Annie was in the back and Megan was in the front. And Annie said the entire ride, she was 100% like that. But they took the selfie and they looked like they were having the time of their life. And she was like, oh no, you have no clue what really happened behind the scenes. <laughs> tandem biking, if no one's ever done it, uh, I encourage you to go you know, rent a tandem and do it. It's It can be wildly fun, but it's definitely uh, a little bit of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work and coordination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so those commercials were fun. Uh, you know, the bank, we'd love to help out anybody that we can and uh, just appreciate you uh, asking me to to be on the podcast. Yeah, for sure. I think I think what you do behind the scenes not as a banker is pretty phenomenal. I mean, working with a homeless or working inside of that type of dynamic, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to step outside of your comfort zone because I think homelessness in general when people see that, they they don't see the person. They see that they see the worst. They see dirt. Yeah. They, they see, see drunk. Yeah. Um, it. You're not giving someone an A. It's scary for a lot of people. Uh -huh. So for you to step outside of your norm and mm. to actually do this, and this is actually a passion of yours, then I thought, why not? It, it makes 100% sense because we're a company that thrives off of passion and collaboration. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as well as that creative aspect. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just thought it'd just be really great and really interesting to just bring you on. I would get Nick Kuhn on, but you know, finding time to sit down with Nick Kuhn is is literally, you know, I have to walk in and pin him down at the hall. I feel like we should buy you a lasso and we could tie him to a chair. Nice. Nice. Maybe maybe that's what that podcast could be is the lasso with Nick. I would have to probably physically move all the podcasting stuff to the hall and get him to do it. That's probably true. Yeah. Yeah, because there's been plenty of times I'm like, I need you to come do voiceover. And it's just literally, I've just finally broken down and sent somebody out there to get it. So, well, they do, one, they do great work and they are, you know, they're, what I would say, their routine has been changed just a tad. And so, um, you know, him being busy and, and all over to makes total sense. But um, if you're listening to this podcast and have not been to the hall, uh, I would encourage you to get to the hall and learn more about JLF when you're there. Right, because now 
all food sales inside the hall, 90%. It's 90? I think so. I always I always get it wrong. I want to say 90%. It's either 90 or 100, guys, because it used to be 10. I know that. Mm-hmm. 90 or 100% of all food sales that you buy at the hall, DSM, goes all directly to the Justice League of Food to sustain that nonprofit. So I know this because I spent t- I've spent lots of time with the Coons. The hall was built to sustain the nonprofit, believe it or not. That big beer hall, they just didn't decide to say, hey, we're going to have this ginormous beer hall for the heck of it. They did it to sustain the nonprofit because homelessness and homeless kids is their passion. Yep, that is 100% right. It uh, It's one of those things that, that you don't see what else is behind the curtain, right? right? So I would tell you the next time you're hungry, thirsty, um, and it doesn't have to be alcohol. It, you can get other drinks there too. Uh, I clarify that just because people think when it's a hall, they're like, oh, I've got to drink beer. No, you don't. Yeah. When you're hungry, thirsty, um, and you're thirsty to l- learn more, uh, go to the hall um, and listen to them. Right. And and, what, and you can just hang out on the beer gardens when that's open as well because it's it's a nice place just to hang out and get fresh air. So. Yep. yep. Well, thanks, Mark. We appreciate your time. And um, if there's anything else that you like to tell us, or, or I mean, or if it's more than what we got time left, we'll probably have you come back. I appreciate it. I think this was just right. My hope is that we 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 move past one listener or at least one like. Uh, and, and if it's really horrible, maybe we could do it again. Yeah, for sure. So if I'm a individual or a business and I want to contact you for banking services, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Best way, come to our West Des Moines location. Uh, I'm there, and if not there, they'll find me. Uh, we're, we're located, if you take that last exit, uh, just outside of the 8035 Mixed Master in West Des Moines, um, and we're on Jordan Creek Parkway. Come into the West, Bank, West, West Des Moines location for Bank Iowa, and I'll help. Yeah, Mark Phillips, Bank Iowa, and then... Uh, You'll see him at most of the Justice League of Food dinners, fundraising events, and things like that, because I always do. So he's always like, hey, I didn't know you were coming. And I was like, I do film this. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for everybody for tuning in. And um, like I said, if you need to get in touch with, with Mark, Bank Iowa, check out Bank Iowa's website, which we'll put on the bottom here, because you know we have that capability. So uh, thanks a lot. Tune in next week for our next episode.